Father, I ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. You alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So one of the chief life lessons from the Wizard of Oz is don't look behind the curtain. Because if you look behind the curtain, you're going to be disappointed by what you see. Uh, I've always taken this to heart. I, I remember years ago, I had the chance to meet one of my heroes. Yes, it was Bishop N.T. Wright. (laughs) I had the chance to meet Bishop N.T. Wright, and I was a little nervous. Like, do I actually want to meet this guy? Because I've had him on this pedestal, and now I'm going to find out he has feet of clay. Like, we're going to have a real conversation. What's going to happen? Um, He was speaking at Duke uh, Divinity School in their chapel, so I went. I had a collar on. I was like, hey, I was uh, a Southern Baptist, and now I'm Anglican, and uh, it's your fault. (laughs) And we had a very pleasant conversation but uh, it was interesting. He, he was way more real as a human after meeting him. Um, and sometimes you're a little worried about looking behind the curtain, seeing, seeing what's back there. Uh, just this week, um, Deacon Tex and I were on a clergy retreat in the booming metropolis of Talladega, Alabama. <laughs> and Talladega, Alabama is famous in our household, I think, for being the worst single meal that I've ever had. Uh, we went to a camp, and the food was so bad at the camp that we left, and we found a burger joint. And we're like, man, who, who can mess up a hamburger, right? And um, we had the, the worst hamburger ever. I mean, ever. <laughs> ever. Um, and then, man, we, we, someone went up to get ketchup. And you know how a lot of restaurants will have like little flyers up, like advertising businesses or, or different things? Um, well, this, this one had a flyer up, and it was a little odd because it was advertising a mortuary service. And then we realized it was owned by the same folks. <laughs> and we were like, don't look behind the curtain. <laughs> what? Did we just got like Sweeney Todded in Talladega, Alabama. This is terrible. Um, now, I think we all know this, this, this feeling of, man, you look behind the curtain and things are not what you had hoped. Not what they said. I know we have people here every Sunday that you've looked behind the curtain at church. Um, and you've been like, man, I don't know. This is not, uh uh-uh. uh. This is bad. Uh, there's a gap between what's presented in public and what's behind the curtain. And I actually think that's why I love what we're going to look at for a little bit this morning. This is a, a streamlined service, uh, but we get to look on the last Sunday of Epiphany at the transfiguration of Jesus. And in many ways, this is a few of his disciples, his closest circle, are going to look behind the curtain at our Lord and find out, is he really who he said he is? What is he actually about, this one, uh, the Lord Jesus? And so we're going to look at Mark 9, verses 2 through 9, and see what they learned on the mountain with their Lord, the Lord Jesus. Um, And so first, our section begins, we're looking at Mark, and uh, Mark is very intentional in how he sketches the scene. Um, This is a pivotal moment in the Gospels, and he gives us some clues, or some, he sets the context for us, verse 2, says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He's going to let them look behind the curtain. These are his closest disciples, and he has something to show them. Uh, We're told, where does this happen? Well, it's up on a high mountaintop. Um, And high mountaintops are always pretty important in the scriptures. Um, Kind of, if you're reading the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, um, and you hear about a high mountaintop, you're probably first thinking of Mount Sinai, where after God's people were delivered from slavery um, in Egypt, God led his people to Mount Sinai. And Moses went up on the high mountaintop and he met with the Lord. And God revealed himself on a high mountain. Here is going to be another high mountain. And the Lord will reveal himself to them. We even get a time stamp here after six days. And so if you're curious, you might go, well, what happened six days ago? 
Um, what, what, what happened? What, what occurred? Um, two things. One, if you hear, and after six days, Genesis might ring in your, in your ears. <laughs> six days of creation, then you have Sabbath and new creation. Well, that's going to happen here. But in this immediate context, in Mark 8, before Mark 9, six days ago, was the first time in his life Peter got the answer right to any question. (laughs) Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of God. And six days later, Jesus takes him up on a mountain. This is the epiphany season. Uh, Peter has this epiphany of identity. Here's who Jesus is. And Jesus says, well done, but you don't get it yet. Let me show you who I am. And so he invites him up onto uh, the mountain from an epiphany of identity to an epiphany of glory. And Mark tells us that um, they go up, they're on the high mountain, and verse 2 says, he was transfigured uh, before them. His clothes became radiant, intensely white, As no one on earth could bleach them, this, by the way, is slipping past the bounds of language. They're trying to describe this thing that is mind-blowing in its glory and its beauty. Um, And then we're told there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. That's an odd scene. Um, Jesus is transfigured. He, He bursts forth in indescribable beauty and radiance. And then he's talking with Moses and Elijah, um, the law and the prophets. He's having a conversation. (laughs) The whole Old Testament is now having a conversation with the word who became flesh, the Lord Jesus. And his closest followers are getting to see all the way behind the curtain and trying to figure out what they think about what they are seeing. Um, it's, It's glorious. It's beautiful. This idea that Jesus is in these robes that is, you know, a white that no one could imagine. It's, it's just to go, man, this is purity incarnate. Think about how wonderful and glorious and beautiful is uh, the Lord Jesus. And he's shining. Um, do, you, do you get that? I said there's a radiance that comes from Jesus. Um, and, and that's very intriguing to me because, um, well, on Mount Sinai, there was radiance too, if you remember. Moses meets with the Lord. The Lord, you know, hides him in the cleft of the rock, passes by. He, he encounters um, the Lord. And then do you remember what happened to Moses? His face lit up. It, it reflected and shined with this light of the Lord's glory. And it was so bright that it said he had to put a veil on to go down and talk with the people. And over time, it finally faded, <laughs> Uh, But there was this light that came from an encounter with God, with his presence, with his power, with his person, um, and it stuck with Moses. Now, that light didn't come from Moses. It came from his encounter uh, with God, and that's the the point here, is that Jesus isn't just reflecting the glory and light of God. He is radiating it. It's emanating from him. He's the source of it. It's the difference in, we, we can think of the sun is a, is a light, and it's a light source. Um, the moon, what? The moon reflects the light. Moses is the moon, Jesus is the sun. The light comes from him. Uh, the author of Hebrews puts it this way, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. If you want to know who God is, Scripture says, look at Jesus. If you want to know the character of God, look at Jesus. If you want to understand glory and holiness and beauty, uh, look at Jesus. And that's why I think this scene is so um, interesting. Because when we talk about observing Jesus, um, we're told that Jesus actually in his earthly ministry in many ways veiled his glory. He, he hid it. Like in some ways, Jesus um, tied one arm behind his back. Philippians says he emptied himself of the glory that was rightly his um, to come among us and to live among us. It's interesting to think about the fact that most of us, I think, present 
as better than we are. We're worried. What if people look behind the curtain of my life? What will they find? And the New Testament tells us that Jesus did the reverse. That that he actually veiled himself because we just couldn't take it in all at once. Not because he had something to hide, but because it was just too good to perceive initially. And so in the transfiguration, the curtain is pulled back and you go, oh my goodness. (laughs) It's not I'm disillusioned by what's behind the curtain. It's I'm, I'm illuminated by what's behind the curtain. It is worthy of every adoration and uh, praise. This, this is who Jesus has been and is and will be forever, and we get a glimpse of it. Uh, one scholar, uh, Joel Green, he writes that we understand in this, in this passage, um, we don't imagine that Jesus becomes in his transfiguration what he was not already, but rather that his exalted identity is momentarily on full display. They reveal who he is in all of his glory and beauty and majesty. This is holy ground to be on this high mountain, the transfiguration. They are able to see Jesus as he truly is. Um, And I want to just submit to you that if you you think about this, um, if you think about what we actually even need when we come to church, we just long to see Jesus, don't we? I mean, think about it. I, there was this song we used to sing when I was in college, which was a long time ago. And it's dangerous sometimes to look back to songs. Like I was teaching our foundations class yesterday. Some of them are here. And we were looking at John 14. Jesus says, in my father's house are you know, many rooms. I'm like, oh, it's like that song, Big House. I was like, I don't know this song. <laughs> Friends, I looked it up, and I wish I hadn't known that song. <laughs> it's not good. It's just like the most like generic Christian plastic song I've ever heard. It's all about football. <laughs> Do you know the song? It's terrible. Sorry. I've just, I've just put it in your mind. Um, but yeah, sometimes we see, sing things that don't make a lot of sense, even in church. And so we used to sing this song in our, in our college campus ministry, um, and it was, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And we would get kind of snarky about it because our understanding was if you see God, well, we had watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, Like, it's fatal. And we're like, I don't know if you really want to pray that (laughs) or sing that or wish for that. Uh, But that's what happens here. they, They grant them this gift, this glimpse of seeing the Lord in his beauty and his goodness. Um, and, And it's not something that you, you know, he doesn't walk around like that all the time. It's something that they could only experience for a moment. And even that moment was enough for Peter to say, hey, can we just stay here? Can we like build some tents? Can we stay here? Um, and, and it's, you know, Jesus says, no, we have work to do. But of course, ultimately, like the Christian life, our vocation, our ultimate like purpose is that we will see the beauty of of God in the face of the Lord Jesus. We will dwell with him forever. And so we'll actually get the answer to that, you know, kind of juvenile. So open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. It's like, good, I want to show myself to you. I want to be with you. I want to make a way that you can see me um, and experience the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We, we pray it every week at the communion table. Lord, would you bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. That's our hope. It's not in a a house with lots of rooms where we can play football. It's to be with the Lord Jesus, to see him and his beauty and his glory, to actually be transformed into his likeness by God's grace and the work of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 uh, says that we all with unveiled face, that's again talking back to Moses, with unveiled face beholding the glory of God uh, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. In other words, if you look at the transfiguration and go, I wish I was there and could have seen the Lord like that, you will. 
it's a little different because now he has scars because of his cross and resurrection. But you'll see the Lord in his beauty. You'll see the Lord in his goodness. Those who have been called to him is an overwhelming promise and the great hope of the church. And again, we're so used to looking behind the curtain of people appearing one way and really being something else, of being deceived and betrayed and tricked and disillusioned. But this turns that on its head. Rather than appearing better than he was, Jesus was even better than he appeared. And so he reveals his glory on the mountain. Rather than appearing better than he was, Jesus was even better than he appeared. And I would just say, if, 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 if you're someone who has seen behind the curtain of church and been left disillusioned and crushed and hurt or abused, um, Jesus hates that. And he would say, look on me. Look on beauty. Look on glory. Uh, let's transform this into something different. And what would it mean for us today? What would it mean for your life if we could even grasp just a, a little bit of the beauty and the goodness and the glory of Jesus? If we could even catch just a, a fraction of the love that he has for you and for me and for us, I think it would transform us. It would overwhelm us. It, it would lead to adoration. We would have to worship. It would lead to obedience. We'd have to listen to him. The voice actually says here in the transfiguration, hey, that's my beloved son. Listen to him. Do what he says. Like the whole epiphany season, you get these brackets. You get his baptism, and the voice from heaven says, that's my son with whom I'm well pleased. Here at the end of the epiphany season, that's my son. Listen to him. And, and how would you not? Because look who he is. Look at his glory. Look at his uh, beauty. And then he tells them, we can't stay here. We've got something to do. We've got somewhere to go. And this moment in all of the Gospels, the transfiguration, is this hinge, this pivot point. And it's like from his birth to his growing up to his, his ministry and his mission, this is the exclamation point. Here's how beautiful and glorious he is but that's not the full story. Because then it says he has somewhere to go, something to do. He'd been talking with Moses and Elijah um, about another gospel says his exodus, his departure, his death. And he leaves this high mountain of the transfiguration and he descends to the mountain of his cross. It's a march, Jerusalem or, uh, or bust in, in many ways. Um, I actually really like the way Luke puts it. He says that Jesus set his face to go to uh, Jerusalem. You get the, the, the symmetry? He goes up on the mountain. His face is changed to see his beauty. You have this experience on the mountain, and his face is changed again, but it's that he, he sets his face to go to Jerusalem. Um, and, and that's what we always have in the church year. Epiphany can be really short. Epiphany can be really long. Epiphany season starts with his baptism. It ends with the transfiguration. Whether, whether it's short or long, it says, hey, before we move into Lent, before we begin our preparation and march towards the cross, let's be reminded of his beauty and then set our face to go to Jerusalem. And so we get it right before this kind of change of season. Uh, we, get, we see this here. Um, question. There's a lot of debate about this passage. It's pretty fantastic. It's, it's supernatural. It's interesting. Some have said it's, it's one of the most um, shocking metaphysical events of the New Testament. And that like, man, you pulled back the curtain and saw reality. This is who Jesus is. Uh, but some of the debate that's really interesting has said that the actual change that took place here um, was not necessarily or not just with Jesus. A big thing that changes here on this mountain is that his disciples 
are given the gift of perceiving his glory. They're changed. They get a sense of, oh, this is who he is. They've been with him for years. Oh, this is who he is. Set his face to go to Jerusalem. Oh, this is what he came uh, to do. And so in the same sense that we're going to perceive his glory and beauty uh, in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, we also can pray for that gift. Lord, would you show us who your son is? Um, and some of us need that Mark 8 sense of like, we don't even, we don't have nowhere to start. Okay, you're the Christ. Good. Okay, we kind of have an idea of who you are. But others of us, like the disciples, we've been walking for years and years with Jesus, and we still don't even know half of his glory and beauty. And we say, Lord, would you show us who you are? Would you change um, us to actually perceive um, the glory of God in the face of um, your son? And that's what, as we kind of move into Lent, and we think about moving into Lent, this is this kind of transitional Sunday, um, that would be my prayer for you and for me and for all of us. Uh, Lord, would you show us your son more clearly? Would you do a work in us by your Holy Spirit that would lead to adoration and obedience and mission? That we would be drawn even more to worship your son in his beauty? That we would listen to him and then, and then mission that we would want to go out and be his hands and feet. Proclaim the light of this good news to others so that they too um, could be engulfed by this goodness. And thanks be to God that unlike almost everything in our life, that Jesus, rather than appearing better than he was, was and is even better than all that we could hope or imagine. And so we worship him. We pray to him and we ask for him to be at work in our midst. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.